Good afternoon. Welcome back. Sean here at Mountains Garage. It's Friday afternoon, and like I've been doing the last few weeks, which is semi-popular, I'm going to wrap up and talk about things that took place during the week, uh, little tidbits that add up to a video. In front of me, you may notice, is a transmission. No, it's not the one I'm going to build, the Race 475 with the aftermarket bell housing. I promised we're going to do that together, and I'll hold myself to that. This transmission belongs to a friend of a friend, who I now call a friend. I only met him a couple months ago. Pretty good dude. He just bought this cool Chevelle. Unassembled, big block, turbo 400, and he wanted it looked at. So I went and picked it up, next town over. Popped it apart, see what was in there, and you may notice the blue tag on top of the bell housing. The red tag is the SFI number, the blue riveted tag. I was pretty sure I meant this was an actual JW built transmission. So I called them specifically to ask the question what it came with for pots when it left their factory. And two, do you have to push the button to back up? Because when I go to deliver it, that's usually the first pe question people ask is, do I have to push the button or not? Uh, side note, Often, even if it backs up in reverse, it'll still back up in neutral with the button pushed, So, which is really handy if you're all strapped in and you can just bump it into neutral and push the button to back up. That's way handier than operating the reverse lockout and backing up without having to push the button. But either way, you know, once you get used to your shifter and you might as well practice running it in the dark because next thing you know, the first time you go to the track, it's going to be dark out and you'll be in there fumbling around, unless it's second nature. So the nice guy at JW Performance Transmission said he'd call back in 10 or 15 minutes. He had to go look it up in the old paper files because it left there in July 2006 before they had electronic records, apparently. So he sure enough called me back within 10 minutes and said it left there without a break. It has a JW break in it, I determined, because it says JW on one spot. And it left there without a break, so he wasn't sure of his answer, and I'm pretty sure he will have to push the button to back up. But even if you look up their break online, they don't really go into descriptions, and that's as far as I left it. So if you have a JW TH400 break, let me know. Do you have to push the button or not? I have a few days before he's going to pick it up. I could still give him the correct answer, because I try hard to be able to answer anybody's question concerning at least their own transmission. So... But nobody has all the answers. That's why I called them to ask. Who would know better? Looking at the complete transmissions that are available today, I determined I'm giving mine away. <laughs> but it was kind of cool. I looked at the uh, cut that was made for the Ultra Bell, and I'll show it to you. And they advertise it's a CNC machine that does it. It doesn't look human obviously done by a machine. I can get pretty close with the old uh, M18 cordless grinder, but this one here is uh, nearly perfect. However, like anything else, it's up to the, the viewer to decide whether they like it as is or they could improve upon it. If you're a hot rodder, you look at everything and say, I can improve upon that. So I also changed the method of attaching it because it has a JW Ultra Bell that's way out of date, but for this car, it's fine. That's probably not a problem. So it still provides the protection, whether the sticker is there or not. And actually on this one, somebody cut off the ears that would have made it fit Olds Buick Pontiac Cadillac. Anyway, so let's take a peek at it. The gap is very similar to what I like to leave. The exception is down here, I like to flare it out to follow this contour. I think it makes the pan rail stronger. And I kind of nip this off a little bit here, but again, this is done on a machine, so it's a consistent gap, but it's still a gap. And like I mentioned, somebody did lop the ears off that would have adapted the whole Pontiac Buick Cadillac. They are kind of gummy the way they stick up. But any modifications to the housing Probably means it has to be sent back, which it does anyway because it's long out of date. And this is before they made the LS version, I guess, and cut it off. 
after the fact. Of course, I added the bolts and stuff. I was able to not get into a paint debacle by washing the case. It was almost as clean when I got it, and I was able to just simple green it and blow it off and start reassembly. That was a blessing. Inside, it was pretty straightforward. Five, five, and three clutches. 34 element sprag. Roller output. Pretty normal stuff. In my last video, I mentioned while gathering parts for my TH-475 that I was looking for a roller tail housing because I have a strange yoke with the N on the end of the part number, which mean it's, means it's made for a roller yoke on the drive shaft. I shopped around and even the offshore brands they started at $140 or so until I thought to check BTE transmissions. And sure enough, they had a beautiful, well, it'll be here tomorrow. I'll judge whether it's beautiful or not, but it sure looks it in the picture. A roll of tail housing for $106. And I've been curious of their bell housing, their bolt on bell housing. They do theirs a little different. They have an adapter ring that bolts on the pump, and then their housing also fits the reed case, the aftermarket case. So once you buy the housing, you run the adapter on the stock case, and if you eventually upgrade the case, you don't have to buy another housing. So while I had them on the phone, I got one of those as well. So I mentioned this transmission in front of me that I attached the bell housing to the pump a little bit different. JW uses O-rings on the bolts. Uh, whoever last assembled this one just went with about a tube of black sealer and I have about an hour and a half in scraping all that off there. I couldn't even hardly get it off there. It was sealed up nice. But all the way through the threads into the case of the transmission was caked with black silicone. The whole face of the pump, it was a mess. So. Uh, my new method, it's the first one I've done, inspired by the ATI housing that I bought that I'm probably going to use on the 475, they use a gasket. It's just like a pump gasket, but there's no holes for fluid to flow through. It's just got the eight holes, and you set it on the pump, set the housing on it, and then you need to seal the bolts with a tiny bit of rock TV, but that's it, and that should be easy cleanup. So I actually... Just like I said, with it facing north, I uh, put my studs in there, set the gasket on top of the pump, set the housing down dry. I filled each bolt indentation where the wash is going to sit with a little bit of clear ITV, bolted it all together and wiped off the excess that you can't even tell. And again, when I have to remove it next time or whoever does, it's going to be a lot easier than all that scraping I had to do because I don't know what they used, but it was some pretty good stuff. This is the dry shaft I built for the 72 Nova. And the part number that ends with an N means it's hardened, I nitrated, I think I call it. And it's slightly larger, I believe, only by a few thousandths than a traditional bushing style yoke. So this is made to run on a roll of barren. I think it would have run on the bushing okay because you got quite a bit of tolerance there, but I needed a tail housing anyway. And I think at $106, that was a, a good buy considering a stock one runs in the $80 range at least with a bushing. And now for a quick story about my shop and the dangers of LED lighting. <laughs> the spring of 2006 was the wettest I ever remember. It really hampered progress on getting the trees cut, the stumps removed, and a slab where I'm sitting. But by the 4th of July, it got accomplished. My older brother, my only brother, had volunteered to help me build the garage. The first piece of advice, and one of the many he gave me that was spot on, because at this point, I, I built a doghouse that wasn't very good, and that's the only thing I'd ever built. 
He had experience. He, before we started doing anything, we spent three or four days putting a row of blocks around the slab to move the wood up high enough where it's not going to rot over time. A great piece of advice. A lot of people pour the slab, put a pressure treated thing right down there, and in 20 years or less, they got a hole if you have a wet, you know, even if it's down on ground level and it rains, no matter where you are, it's probably going to rot out. So that was extra work. I was oblivious to, but we did that. We got it framed. We started 4th of July weekend with the blocks, and by Labor Day weekend, it was closed in with windows. I had done the garage doors myself at this point. That was the best summer of my life for learning. I, I don't like being outside sweating. I was outside sweating all the time, every night, as soon as I get home from work, and every weekend, just getting it done, working toward a goal. So by that winter, I was insulating. I was wiring, insulating, painting, I would have done a few things different, my choices of materials, but hey, here we are, many years later, still enjoying it. So by springtime, it was time for lighting. The exciting part, painting the floor, putting the lighting up. I got a deal, I believe it was a closeout at one of the giant, you know, home store warehouses, because uh, eight foot T8s were kind of you know, losing their popularity, there was better options with two T5 lighting coming out. LEDs were probably not thought of yet. So I bought all these 8-foot T8s for like $30 a piece. And every three or four years, each fixture loses the ballast. And I replace that with a $30 ballast, and then it's been a good light. I've yet to put a bulb in one, which is pretty good. I have one fixture with one bulb out, so this morning I dug out two new bulbs and that did not fix my problem in that particular light. But I had that light apart because I was adding some LEDs, so let's take a look at that. I bought a 10 pack of 8 foot LEDs and they came in the size box that one of my current lights came in. I've shown this before, but this light was a gift a couple of years ago from an electrician and this one hardwire is in it's probably a lot better quality it's definitely a lot better quality than the ones the 10 pack that i bought but this was the first led light i put up and i realized how bright they are the 10 pack i bought comes with a variety of cords i don't know if you can see it in the shadow but it had a cord that came just long enough i was able to enter this light to connect power and then they just hooked together and my goal is to go all the way down because it was dark on this side but the light these provide is unreal <laughs> this this whole corner was dark because just the way the shadows worked out wow i'm still kind of freaked out about how bright it is at this point i was goofing around last night and took one out of the box and i just wire tied it under my new shelf they all have this three-prong connector. They give you three choices. You have a short one that you hardwire in. There's a longer one that would connect two lights together. So it's two of these on each end. And then the ones in the ceiling have just have a short connector and you just shove them together. The light itself hooks into a couple of clips. And the last option is they also give you a power cord for each one with a switch. So that's what I just stuck it in an outlet here, just goofing around. But it's unreal because I wanted to light this area up under the shelf. I had to turn it toward the wall so it doesn't blind me because it really does that. But man, it uh, certainly solves all your, your problems. And they're relatively inexpensive. The lights in the third bay, which was the first lift that I had, I ran lights down both sides. These are actually... Uh, a gift from an electrician buddy of mine. They actually came out of the same college that my lathe did. I think I've told that story before, but I'm going to run some LEDs that don't come on with these, so these can be left off most of the time. And it'll be a whole lot brighter. So I got lots of ceiling to work with. And as I get time, I'll be uh, adding more LEDs. So far, I've only used four of the ten. I'm still soaking pots in the evaporust. I just took a bunch out that are still wet over here and reloaded the old five gallon bucket. It's uh, 
pretty easy process. I just put them in there till I forget about them and then pull them back out. Time doesn't seem to hurt anything, especially these are all pretty rusty. So from here, I take each piece and start inspecting it, put it in the lathe, put some memory paper to it, make it look better, and then make a determination whether it's worth keeping or not. So do you remember, oh, before I talk about the tiny tail housing, look at that Corvette yoke came with the Corvette transmission. I let that soak in the evapor rest. That's restoration quality right there. The tiny tail housing from the purple Turbo 400 of a month or so ago and the mystery surrounding it because everything's smaller. Uh, this came on a core I bought a few weeks ago, so now I have two of them. But wait, there's more. When I dug out my Turbo 400 cores last week, uh, one, I found the chain I was looking for because stuffed way into the left in the green box. This was a transmission out of my 49 Chevy pickup project. And lo and behold, I'm pretty sure I had it. That is the small yoke and the small tail housing. So it's 400 spline, but externally it's smaller. So that's interesting. I probably won't use it, but now we have three tail housings and one yoke. So back to the dangers of LED lighting. I installed an LED light strip over my bar in the kitchen in my house. And now when I go back and flip on the incandescent fixture by accident instead of the LED, I realize how dark things were. It didn't seem it at the time when I put up that incandescent fixture. It was an extra light at the time in my kitchen and I thought it was great. Same goes for the shop. I've been perfectly happy with my semi-yellow light that I had until I turned those LEDs on. And now it's very bright. You can choose the the color of the light you want. These are bright. And wow, I don't think my eyes have adjusted yet. Probably need to go in and take a nap. So there's no real danger. Just you get used to being able to have all this light and you don't want to be without it. Everything seems easier. So whatever. Hey, it's Friday. I hope you have a great weekend. Like, share, subscribe, all that normal stuff. And uh, I'll catch you in a couple days. Take it easy.